So Hare Krishna, thank you very much, Kandadi Prabhu, for joining today for this discussion. So I would like to start by today. I thought we'll discuss on science and spirituality from a bhakti perspective or a Gaudiya Vaishnava perspective. So maybe I could start with how did you uh, get involved in scientific outreach and what are you doing in that area? Can you tell that first? Then we can. Okay. Well, I came to Krishna consciousness in uh, 1975 and joined the temple at Bhaktivedanta Manor. Um, my main uh, preaching was through book distribution and then through um, work with our uh, Hindu congregation in the UK. But I found myself doing a lot of work with um, uh, universities and the Hindu youth. And we even started some youth clubs, uh, summer camps and other initiatives specifically geared to young people who are thoughtful and who are being trained in the scientific background. Now, I had a, a scientific training myself um, and uh, it was always of interest to me. So I kind of was, although I didn't specialize, I was kind of well versed in across the board. And mm -hmm. in the 1970s, um, got to kind of uh, meet some of the members of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, which had just been formed <clears throat> in the late 70s, read all the monographs. I got to spend time with Sadhu Prabhu um, when he was in the UK in 1983, serving at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge University. And then again, uh, over the years, and particularly we worked together in the 90s, um, when he was uh, researching materials for the Temple of Vedic Planetaria. But it's been particularly um, my focus in the last, say, 15 years, when I felt that some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, targets and some of the objectives of the Bhaktivedanta Institute had not been so well fulfilled in latter decades. Um, yes. And I was just very eager to see a kind of renaissance of spiritual um, science um, as Prabhupada wanted it. And I particularly felt that what I had learned from those BI devotees way back was that we focus on the prime issue of consciousness. Because this is the aspect that everyone knows exists. And actually, it is the big Achilles heel. I, it is the big stumbling block uh, and defect of the whole idea that this world is simply physical stuff. Oh, the okay. fact, the existence of consciousness challenges any concept that we can explain this world simply through our physics and the rest of um, applied science. Yes, true. Thank you. So, uh, it's, so you have gone through a remarkable journey, even within your Krishna consciousness. I believe you were the leader of the manor at one time for a quite some amount of time. So was it a conscious decision to withdraw from management and focus more on intellectual outreach at a particular time? Or no, because uh, I always felt satisfied in the service I have been doing. I enjoyed my work uh, with the uh, Indian community in Britain, uh, ministering there and the preaching there. I really enjoyed my time as temple president for 14 years at the manor. It was challenging because of the political circumstances, but all the time there's always opportunities for our own personal study, for research and for application. Um, and I then became involved with trying to develop um, a community for householders and um, looking at what the application of Varn Ashram, that was a big uh, focus during the 90s also. I was involved with the Temple of Vedic Planetarium and all these, I've always enjoyed them and it's, but I suppose that um, in recent years I've had much more opportunity to develop mm -hmm my own interests and uh, that has involved quite extensive study discussions and presentations 
because I believe that if any of us want to really delve into the topics and understand the science of Krishna consciousness and the brilliance of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's not just a question of personal study, but one that we must share and discuss and debate with many other brilliant devotees and and though even those beyond this come we have to hear their ideas we have to know what they're saying we have to see where there is truth and where there is issues that they have not considered okay. so anyone involved in this really has to put in an, a, a serious investment of time and also be willing to be open because our brains and our minds are so limited that we have to be open to not just the, uh, the wonderful knowledge that Srila Prabhupada is providing through his books, but also in how we come to digest that knowledge and understand its relevance and its application. And that needs discussion with other devotees. Yes. Thank you. So you mentioned earlier about consciousness as the area where we are focused on. And uh, when we talk about uh, presenting our perspectives or presenting what we have to say, so basically within the science uh, spirituality interface, especially from what we can provide, <clears throat> I have also over the years been exploring probably the most volatile area uh, is evolution. And then another area is reincarnation. Another area is consciousness studies. So and I my also... approach would be that you cannot understand the nature of evolution and the uh, appearance of the species. That cannot be discussed until you understand what life is. And until you understand what consciousness is, one cannot actually understand what we mean by life. Mm. And until we understand the nature of consciousness, we cannot understand how matter works. And life is that combination of consciousness embodied in matter and its interaction with matter. And we ha you have to study the actual metaphysics, which yes. are not mystic, not magical, not spiritual, but which are the metaphysics which underpin the reality of modern physics. And by understanding consciousness and how matter actually works, then the whole issue of how life appears in this universe becomes rather obvious. And it becomes very clear it is not according to the Darwinian evolutionary model. Yes, true. Now, this is a very interesting point. At and I have, when I studied the evolution creation debate, the, the whole history of Western intellectual science is more God centered than consciousness centered. And you know, to bring consciousness into that discussion is quite a distinctive contribution that we can make. And in, in one sense, we can avoid the because avoid the heavy polarization that comes when you bring in God and uh, creation evolution. Isn't exactly. It? And in fact, my interest is not in the debates between religion and science. I think that's yes. almost a waste of time. My experience is that neither side can open to hear the other because of the sort of um, preconceptions that you have just mentioned. They, you know, science thinks, well, we can't discuss God, and the Christian kind of, or even the Judaic, Abrahamic faiths simply just want to say, God did it, and that's not scientific. So they haven't got anything to say to one another. So my view is we should be discussing not religion, not science, but primarily philosophy, because science really only deals with finding evidence that can be established through observation and experimentation, replication, and so on like that. That's, science deals with evidence. But evidence has to be understood and interpreted in terms of what it actually tells us. And that is, it enters into the philosophy of science. Mm. So 
unless, and unfortunately, the West has forgotten how to do philosophy. And that is our contribution. It is to remind science that actually it can only explore the topics, particularly the topics that go beyond what can be scientifically explored, i.e. by the science method. And anything to do with origins, the nature of consciousness, what is life, what came at the beginning of the universe, these cannot be explored by science. There's a certain boundary which science reaches, and beyond that, it has to apply philosophy. And unfortunately, what is presented in the name of science is really bad philosophy. It is not science, it is bad philosophy. Give you a simple example is any time that there is a scientific explanation which says these things happen by chance or these things happen by random interactions of matter. That's not science. Because you cannot prove through the scientific method that something happens by chance. By definition, science is meant to look at cause and effect. And if you say something is happening by chance, you are saying there is no cause that we can see, prove, or demonstrate. Therefore, you cannot claim that to be a scientific theory. At best, it is a philosophical theory, and it's not even good philosophy. Because even in philosophy, we would logically assume that there should be a cause for things to happen. And we need to be able to keep that door open for science to explore. So the philosophy that if we look at something and say, I cannot understand how that is happening, I cannot see how, you know, how consciousness appears from the brain, I cannot say, oh, it just happens by chance. We have to be able to look at the causes of things. We mm -hmm. keep the door open for science. We need good philosophy. And that's where I feel is the prime contribution that particularly Vedanta philosophy can um, give to the world. Yes, true. Then, you know, I read Richard Dawkins' God, uh, The God <coughs> Delusion. And normally we talk about this, uh, I'm, I'm relating to your point of chance. Normally we talk about either God did it or chance did it. So he yeah. tries to say that actually the question, no evolutionist worth his salt says that anything comes by chance. He says the issue is God or evolution, not God or chance. So now, of course, we can go further and say, where does evolution come from? What is the that's why it's, and that's exactly why it is um, a hopeless discussion, because it's not a choice between those two things. Science cannot deal with God. God cannot be explored, and there's a lot of other aspects that science cannot deal with. It is a science is a methodology. It is not a body of knowledge. It's a methodology which has, ha has actually sacrificed its scope. It said, no, we can't deal with everything. We will deal with certain yes. things that we can observe and measure. So it has reduced its scope of knowledge or its scope of examination for clarity within certain fields. And that's why it has been able to show results within certain limits. Yes, of course. But it is, not the, it is not a process for gaining knowledge for the whole of existence. That is the mistake. And that is the arrogance that is now being shown by many scientists and people who want to deny God. They say, no, science has all the answers. Clearly, science does not have all the answers. It cannot have all the answers. And philosophers have, have known this and have tried to stress this but they're being silenced by many people because of their own motivations in trying to demean anything which might open the door to spirituality. Yes, that's true. Now science operates on methodological naturalism. So basically it looks for natural explanations for natural phenomena. It's like one yeah. aspect of reality it is studying. So when you're talking about philosophy, philosophy itself is a huge field. And uh, one of the major philosophic, going back to the question of you know, how we present us, our, our contribution to science, one of the major challenges to the idea of consciousness being non-material 
is how does a non material soul interact with a material body i think that is a question that has been going on from the Deca time of descartes and yeah, and that's, but this goes back to bad philosophy descartes had a really brilliant insight in his second meditation he recognized that what can i know for certain he said i know my senses give me information about the world but sometimes they make mistake i see something that is a distance i think it's close by and big but actually it's far away and small i see a stick in water it's bent but it's not bent so my mm -hmm. senses play tricks with me and he understood that my mind can play tricks with me so he understood the distinction between himself as the seer the observer and the mind which is yeah. the content of what we observe. And he understood that difference between the mind and the body and its senses. So he actually understood those three elements, but he made the big mistake that the whole of Western philosophy is based on, which is conflation. They conflate consciousness and mind together. Whereas Eastern traditions have always been able to examine the contents of the mind from the first perspective first person perspective of the seer the mind and its thoughts and its emotions um and its sensory impressions these are things that i experience but consciousness is not those things those are the things that consciousness is aware of hmm. so it makes that distinction and that is a crucial distinction which is not there in this analysis of consciousness in the Western world. So that is the first major contribution that we have to make. That you, it's very easy to show that the mind contains qualities that are, cannot be explained in terms of the physicality of the body and the brain. No matter what type of complexity or analysis you do of the brain, it basically contains information in electrical digital formation right but we experience what is in our mind in terms of the imagery we we experience the world when we look at we see a picture now that picture that we are seeing is not present within the brain the brain's only got electricity passing you know jumping from one neuron to another little ions jumping around forming patterns there's no picture there, but we experience a picture. So this, the actual experience, our conscious experience cannot be reduced to that which is in the brain. So everyone knows there is a distinction between the nature of mental content and what the brain has got. So that distinction exists. And we know that we are the observer of the mental content. We know that is happening. So there is a reality of connection between consciousness, the mind, and the body and brain. That connection exists. You experience it every moment. So there's no point saying it's not possible, <laughs> because it obviously is. But we know that the mental functions cannot be explained by the physical functions. And we know that the consciousness functions cannot be explained by the mental functions. So what we say is that you have to recognize the elementary functions that exist. Consciousness, mind, the physicality of the brain. Those three are different functions. Now, the, then people then say exactly what you say. Well, yes, but then what, what is consciousness made of if it's not physical stuff? But we would turn around and say, tell me what matter is made of. Can you tell me what matter is made of as a physicist? No. Subatomic because, particles. Of, because of schooling, you will say, oh, it's molecules, it's atoms, and subatomic particles. No, no physicist will tell you that. Physics does not know what matter is made of, it only describes constitu constituent parts like quarks and electrons in terms of what we what properties we say they have in order to explain what we see them do so physics only tells us what matter is like and what it does 
It never tells us what it is. So we're saying, we'll tell you the same about consciousness. We'll tell you what it is like and what it, what it does. We'll tell you its properties, its functions. And those functions interact with the information content within matter. So consciousness is the observer of matter, and matter is simply energy and information. So there is a natural link between the consciousness function and the matter functions. And that link is information, and consciousness is the observer of information. That is why we are able to interact with the material world, even though we are not part of the physicality of it. That's a lot. Thank you. Let's, uh, I'll just unpack this a little bit. So, um, first thing is, uh, when you said that we, science doesn't know what matter actually is. I think, is it Max Planck or somebody, a prominent scientist said that we, we don't actually study nat nature, we study nature as exposed to our method of observation. Exactly. Science models our experience of the world. It doesn't tell us what the actuality of the world is. Yes. So it's a modeling of our experience of the world, which when you think about it, modeling our experience of the world involves consciousness in two ways. One is our experience, which is related to consciousness, and the modeling, which is our way of cognizing it, of trying to make some kind of rational sense of it. That is another element of consciousness. So simply, we only understand matter from the viewpoint of consciousness. Therefore, we would say as philosophers, you have to study consciousness first. If you don't know what consciousness is, how can you ever know what matter is? And it's insanity for people to come along and say, no, we will explain consciousness from what we know of matter. That is just madness. It doesn't work. It, it ends up in some dreadful conclusions, usually trying to deny that consciousness exists. Yes, that's true. Because I think they Daniel, cannot explain it. Yeah. Daniel Dennett wrote this book, Consciousness Explained, but one of the best critics of his books I've seen is, it is not consciousness explained, it is consciousness explained away. Right. Yes. Yeah. So Now, you mentioned Dawkins. Now, the interesting thing is, Dennett is now being rejected by a lot of people. And in fact, another philosopher, Galen Strawson, um, comes out and his view is, what is the silliest idea ever? And he says, well, there's lots of contenders for the silliest idea ever. But definitely the silliest is to try and say consciousness doesn't exist. That's definitely the silliest. That's... You know? And that's he's right. Cool. Right. So the new idea that um, people like Dawkins and others are saying is that, okay, all right, all right, we have to admit consciousness exists. We have to admit that qualia exists, i.e. the qualities of our mental experience. Those mm. exist. And we have to admit that at present we cannot explain them in terms of the brain and physics. So he, even he is admitting all of that. But he says, maybe in the future, physics will be able to do it. We don't know enough about matter yet to be able to say we can't explain it. So that's just a big open promise. So you can see how modern physics and philosophy of mind has changed in recent decades, where previously they were able to say, yes, we know everything is explained by the brain. It's an epiphenomenon, it's an emergent uh, property. They were able to make statements like this as if it was fact, if it had been proved. No. Now they know they cannot do it at this present time. They just cannot do it, but at the same time, they cannot deny consciousness. So their only recourse is to promise in the future, we will explain it by physics. And we say to them, well, that's fine. But in the future, you don't know what your physics is going to entail, do you? If your physics is as limited as it is now, it's not going to explain anything. But if you expand your physics to include aspects of subliminal forms of matter, such as 
we would explain the tan matras and even the subtle elements, the cognitive elements of mana, buddhi and ahankara. Maybe if you do that, you will begin to understand how those connect with the principal entity of consciousness. Hmm. So okay. these, everything is moving in the direction of, the, of needing the help of the Vedanta, Sankhya, and also the yoga schools. So my study has been particularly, not only to study um, Vedanta, particularly the Srimad Bhagavatam is the perfect exploration of all Vedantic ideas. And it also contains Vaishnav Sankhya, which is the Sankhya philosophy as understood within Vedanta, you know, and consistent with Vedanta. But also the Yoga Sutras can be understood very as being a support and, a, and a helping to understand the details of some of the interaction of consciousness and um, the Sankhya philosophy. So Vedanta, Sankhya and Yoga can go together and together they really are very powerful uh, insights. And my approach in the West is to say to philosophers, look, let's examine this from first principles. Let's go right back to what we agree about consciousness. And let's build on that. And I personally feel that we can actually just use from first principles of philosophy, direct scientific evidence, which is published by reputable universities, and just using those two sources, we can build a whole, we can show you how it all builds together into the bigger picture of the relationship of consciousness and the material energy. Now, the only way we're able to do that is, of course, because we've already studied the insights of Vedanta and Sankhya. So we actually have been given the clue how it all works. If you were looking at these without those insights, you wouldn't be able to put it together. But by just incorporating those insights, and we're not saying you have to believe in it because the Vedas say so. We're saying, here's an insight, apply it to your problem. And you'll see that that problem becomes dissolved. It's, you know, it's sorted, it's solved. So we're saying that the Vedanta, you can believe in the Vedanta ideas, not because it's Veda, but because it solves all the problems that you are facing in science and philosophy. Okay. So this becomes a more, you could say, a rational approach where it's more bottom up rather than saying this is what these scriptures say. We start with this is what is the existing problem. And here is a here is a knowledge source that offers some insights which can solve the problem. So yes, you're absolutely right that we are presenting this as a bottom up process, which, of course, is attractive to the rationalist and the scientist and so on. Mm. But what we are saying and what we know in our hearts is that the only way we're able to construct a bottom-up picture is because we have been given the higher picture mm. by the Bhagavatam and the, the Shastras. But we're not saying believe in them because of, That's <laughs> of true, their yeah. authority. We're saying actually when you take those insights and use them in your building up process, you actually see how it all works. It all makes sense. Yes, bro. So Prabhu, going back to an earlier point, you mentioned that just as science actually doesn't study matter, but studies what matter does and what matter is like. So similarly, we can adopt that same approach for consciousness. So then are we focusing more on a functional, functional study rather than a more of a metaphysical or ontological study? Or in, 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 is it a principle of Vedanta itself that consciousness in itself can't be studied? That consciousness only as it is interacting with matter can be studied? I think initially it's important to indicate and to work on the fact that we're dealing with elementary functions and properties. And um, to explore that. Um, but you're quite right. At a certain point, we need to understand the ontology. But the problem is you cannot, it, it doesn't work from the ontology 
the assumed ontology of physics because physics actually doesn't have an ontology. It doesn't actually define what substance is. So what is the use of trying to base an analysis of consciousness on uh, an ontology which doesn't exist, which doesn't explain matter? If you're going to, if you're going to look at consciousness and the material world from a, a point of view of ontology, you need to do it from an ontology that actually connects consciousness and matter. And that is the Sankhya process. The wonderful, see, put it in a simpler way. When you look at physics and you break things down, you cannot find consciousness. You just cannot find it anywhere okay. in that, right? There's some new ideas on, you know, they've reincarnated um, the panpsychist idea yeah. that maybe alongside mass spin and charge, there's some other property we call consciousness. And that's a fundamental property of matter. But that's speculation, and no one has been able to put it together to form a coherent um, explanation. Really, when you delve by, by physics, you end up with just things that we are saying exists. An electron. What's an electron? We have said that this thing called an electron exists, and we've said it has charge because if it has if it has charge, then we can we say well that works according to mag, you know the electromagnetic kind of effects. So therefore, we can say it's got some charge. We say it's got some mass. We don't know what mass is. But we say it's got mass because then we can kind of show how that interacts with this other concept we still don't know called gravity. And so, so we're just always concocting properties to give to matter to explain what it is like and what it does. But there's no ontology and then we cannot find consciousness through that. Whereas Sankhya looks at matter and it models consciousness in terms of our experience of it. So everything, the, every way that uh, Sankhya looks at the nature of this world and what manifested at the subliminal level relates back to properties that can be experienced by consciousness. So that is the ontology to use to explore consciousness and prakriti, which is the kind of general term for physical matter um, or material stuff both in its subtle and um, kind of gross manifestation. Um, now, the interesting thing is on the ontology, so what distinguishes that which is conscious from that which is not? Well, obviously, the ability for awareness is one, that's the function, but there's another factor, and that is that matter is influenced and manipulated over time. Time affects both physical and subliminal matter. Whereas, By subliminal, you are referring to subtle matter? Subtle matter in different forms. There's subliminal in terms of tan-matric data, which manifests the gross physical properties that we can see and uh, measure. But then beyond that is the cognitive functions of what we would call subtle, the uh, Sharira Linga the mana, buddhi, and the hunkar. So those are the cognitive functions. So beyond them, all of those are affected and manipulated by time. But consciousness is not affected by time, and we know that. Because, you know, moments pass in front of us. This moment that I'm experiencing you now passes. I now see a different picture of you. That's the new image. And then that passes and a new image. But I remain the constant observer of each moment. The moments pass, but I remain the observer. I am yes. not changing in my ontological state because of the passage of time. So that is the key difference between that which is conscious and that which is procreating. Yes. So we could say that there are three levels that there is the outer scene, which is the physical prakriti, and then there's the inner screen, which is the mind, and then there's the inner seer. So yeah, and, and those that three kind of part 
um, is a very simple, it's a simple and a, simpl a simplified model of what Vedanta is saying, but it is a very useful one. Yes, and it it's one that even the West hasn't got, frankly. Western yeah. psychology, Western medicine, Western science, physics and neuroscience, they haven't got that model. And okay. this is something that we discuss with um, uh, psychologists and um, people in the West, that we say, look, even if you don't want to accept the nature of the entity of consciousness, the Atma, and you don't want to give it any special status, still, it is a better model for you to analyze how people experience the world to assume that there is the conscious self yes. and that, be, that the conscious self becomes aware of the stuff of the mind. And we can break down how the mind processes stuff into different categories, particularly the role of mana, the role of buddhi, and the role of ahankar. But all of that is a kind of secondary psychology. Primary psychology is the psychology of the Atma. Secondary psychology is that of what is being processed within this overall thing we'll call mind. The mind in the Western terminology is very uh, vague, honestly. Yes. But we kind of can just use it there. And then the third level that affects what we experience and how we experience that is, of course, the neurology of the brain and how it is processing information about the world. So if we have a disorder in terms of what we're experiencing, we can look and see, is it something to do with our senses? Like, you know, you and I are wearing glasses, you know, our eyes need a little help. Or is it a neurological issue? Is there something not firing well in the brain? Or is it how the mind is processing that information? and perhaps misreading that data and presenting it to us in a strange way. And then ultimately we have to look at the primary psychology of the Atma and understand what are its motivations? What are its intentions? What is involving it in this whole aspect of why we're experiencing the stuff of the mind? What's going on? So you are attributing emotion to the mind and intentionality to the atma here certainly um and this is something we, we need to kind of pick apart very carefully because because of the problem of conflation in the west mm. where everything's just the brain you know yeah mind consciousness you know experience emotions personality it's just brain that's pathetic it's i mean it's it's been beyond pathetic and mm. um, trying to pull it apart, the Atma is that which is conscious and therefore that is, we are that which has the experience. Now the interesting okay. thing is what we are experience, what, what is our experience of? And that we can kind of, um, one of the concepts that is used in Western philosophy, although it's not properly understood, is the idea of the theater of consciousness that we yes. appear to be the audience seeing stuff presented to us on the screen or on the stage of consciousness. And that's a good analogy, actually. I think that's helpful for us because if I am watching some kind of film on the screen, I start to identify with the characters. I start to worry about them. Nothing is happening to me. I'm sitting here quite comfortably in my, uh, at home. But I'm now starting to worry about what's happening to these characters. I'm worried, you know, they're going to get hurt. I'm worried something nasty or something frightening happens. So I'm allowing my emotions, my, the experience of my own emotions, to be affected by what is being presented on the screen. And in that way, the Atma, it goes through experiences because of identification of what the mind is presenting to us. Now, we can get very technical and explain that that actual process of identification with what the mind has actually happens within the sheathing of ahankar. Because in the material world, we are not an, an, an atma 
if, you know, free and complete in itself. We are the Atma encased in the Ahankar. And that covering means that what we identify with is practically wholly and solely the experience that, that the Ahankara is gathering from the mind. So you mentioned okay. intentionality. That's another important uh, aspect. And we would say that the Atma is the source of will. Vedanta explains that the Atma is Hetu, which means it's causal. It generates will. Now, having will doesn't mean that we can do anything we like. We're not omnipotent. Will is simply that I wish to change the experiences that I'm having, right? It's yeah. simply the aspiration to change my experiences. And that becomes encoded. That kind of will becomes encoded within the ahankara and then within the buddhi. And because of that, it then becomes manifest as intention and developed as desires by the mind, which then become aspects of action by our body. Okay, so now you're differentiating between will and intention. So, I prefer to, personally, simply to avoid the conflation aspect. Okay, makes sense. Because I think, um, yeah, let's, people uh, talk about free will, and the, the free will only exists with the Atma. Yes. Whereas intention can be something that either is trying to interpret our will, or it can be something that may be conditioned by the way the mind processes stuff. And okay. a lot of how we act is conditioned. You yes. know, um, some smell of some nice cooking wafts through the air, I, you know, enters my nose, sets up a, a flash in my brain. The mind reads that and says, oh, that smells good. And immediately the mind is going, oh, food, I want to eat something. So practically speaking, without any conscious input from ourselves, the mind can be making up all sorts of ideas. I think you should go and find something to eat, you know? It yeah. can be driving action. And almost we have to say, no, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. You know, we've almost got to stop. We have to use what's called free won't. I, <laughs> free won't. I won't do it. Instead of willing to do it, I will not do it. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's called free won't, you know? Where we have... In that moment, but when the mind is coming up with all these ideas, we have the opportunity to interject yes or no. So even though most of our activities may be conditioned or may be inspired by conditioning, there still is the opportunity for the Atma to interact with the activities of the mind and to interject with some aspect of will or won't. Yeah. <clears throat> so... I think one, going into the technicalities of uh, Manabuddhi Hankar might be a bit too much at this stage. Uh, uh, just one question that when we talk about Western, Western thought systems not really acknowledging the difference between the mind and the soul, now from an empirical perspective or from a Western scientific perspective, is there a way to differentiate between the two? One is, of course, what you said, our lived experience, that there is uh, the content of thought, and we could say there is the conscious perceiver, or conscious experiencer. Those, that, is, that is something which is like an intuitive exercise that anybody can do. But beyond that, now I have discussed, just I'll complete this question. I discussed this with... Uh, Devamrut Maharaj, who has written that Searching for Vedic India, and Dhrutakarma Prabhu. Dhrutakarma Prabhu and Devamrut Maharaj, both of them, in their book, attribute near-death experiences to the mind and past life memories to the soul. So, which is, I felt, an interesting differentiation that we could say that um, certainly the soul is going from one body to another. But now this is just the way they did it. But is there any empirical way to talk about these two inner levels of the mind and the body? So 
if this is a model like you said this is a model that can better explain reality and that's true but is there any way to substantiate that model yeah well i think the i start with trying to analyze the content of our experience okay right which is mental stuff if you like okay and the way that's um, explored from the Western point of view is to understand this concept of what are called qualia. I'm sure you're familiar with qualia. Yes. But um, qualia are defined as the qualities of our mental experience. Yes. And it all goes back to the same point, and I remember talking, uh, Sadaputa describing this to me way back in the 80s. And it hit me then, and it has remained the key question because this is the essence of what is called the hard problem of consciousness it was ignored it was it's no, it was known about for you know a couple of centuries it was the mid uh, um, 19th century when the word qualia was coined actually but it was never really explored very much during the 20th century because science was just into behaviorism and functionalism and things like that whereas it was in 94 when a philosopher from Australia called David Chalmers came forward and yeah, said, no, like you guys are ignoring qualia. And if you yeah. can't deal with qualia, you can't deal with consciousness. Right? So, and it all stems on this point that the brain has got electricity, but how we experience the world is a picture. So how do you get from the electric electrical activity of the brain to this picture that is there in our experience. How, why do we experience that picture with its qualities that we call qualia, such as colors and forms? How do we explain these? Now, people say, well, it's all to do with, say, colors is to do with light. Okay, a wavelength comes into our eye. It sets off uh, one of the three types of cones that we have, depending on particular wavelength. That sends a digital bleep to the brain. Where's the color? The wavelength is simply just because of its nature as a wavelength, not because of its color, because of its wavelength, it has activated a photoreceptor. That photoreceptor is now just converted whatever was out there into this bleep. It fired. An ion jumps from that neuron to the next neuron, and from that neuron to the next. And that's basically all that goes on all the way up to the brain. Where is the color? Neurons don't have color. Electricity does not have color. But we experience that as a color. So what is the process that is taking the data, that electrical data, the same data that is in your computer, and actually generating something in your mind that is a picture? That is the big issue and the hard problem. So we can easily establish the reality of qualia and the fact that qualia are irreducible to physical biological processes. They cannot be explained by the brain. They are something, they have their own essence, right? So we have made that separation of mind and brain. Now, through the meditation processes, particularly of the yoga systems, we can do exercises which separate ourself as the conscious entity from that which we are conscious of, i.e. the pictures, the impressions, the thoughts in our mind. We can recognize that these are the vrittis, according to the yoga sutras, that are passing in front of us. But I am the observer of that. So that's separating ourselves from the theater of the mind. So those processes are very simple. And once you've kind of got that process, then you start, things start to fall into place. You start to be able to understand how this weird, wonderful thing about consciousness and how we experience the world actually works. Um, in the uh, Atma Paradigm webinar, we also get a lot into the neuroscience of perception. And it is shocking to understand how badly the brain is able to present the world to you. It has got very little data, and it takes so long to process it. 
you shouldn't be able to experience anything practically. It's shocking. <laughs> okay. So um, th there's some good fun in some of those lectures that uh, help to explain that point. Yes. Bro. Just continuing with your point of, say, electricity in the brain and we experiencing at pictures. In this itself, we could actually differentiate between the also the screen and the seer. The one is how is the picture generated and who is seeing the picture? That would well, that's a good example. And that's, you're absolutely right. It's like um, we're obviously seeing each other on computer screens at the moment. But why does a computer have a screen? It's not for its own purposes. Hmm. You know? The computer does not need a screen in order to crunch data and to produce output. But somehow or other, computers have a screen. And the reason they've got a screen is because they're trying to communicate that electrical digital data that exists within it into a format that can be understood and appreciated and even enjoyed by something which is not itself. So we would then describe the mind simply as that interface screen between the hardware of the brain and the observer, you know, as I am now with this screen. So the mind yeah. acts in that way. It takes the data of the brain, puts it into a different format, and a format that can actually be appreciated by the observer, the atma. Okay. And from this perspective, when you talk about the qualia, so say is color, taste, and all these things, at one level, we could say that they are properties of matter. At another level, we could also say they are they are attributes experienced in the mind. You and see, there is some link. To, well, there's obviously a link with the outside world, the information that the brain gets, and what we experience. There is a link. Yes. But it is not as direct as people tell you it is. And a, a simple example is color. When you're at school, you learn that there is a visible spectrum and it forms these rainbow colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? Mm. Those are the spectrum. Now, when Isaac Newton examined the spectrum, as he, did, he was one of the first in the West to really explore um, visible spectra, he then thought, well, this is interesting. If each of these wavelengths is a color, and that's how we explain color, it's got a wavelength, right? That's what you're told at yeah. school. That's true, yeah. That color is simply the wavelength of light. Yeah. Then he asked, well, where's magenta? Where's, which wavelength is magenta? That's... It's not there. <laughs> okay. And in fact, out of the million colors that you experience, only a fraction of them appear to be in that spectrum. So now, go back to magenta. Magenta is when, and then the people say, well, it's simply red and blue mixed together. Because if you have red light and blue light and you put them together, you get magenta. But you have to ask yourself in physics, not just in kindergarten language, you have to analyze the physics and ask yourself, how, uh, where is the mixing happening of those two wavelengths? Because you cannot take one wavelength and another wavelength, put them together and form a third, a different wavelength. That's not how physics works, mm. is it? And neither is it happening in the eye because the wavelength associated with red, which is around 650 nanometers, goes into, you know, activates one cone, and the wavelength associated with blue activates a different cone. So two different photoreceptors are now sending independent bleeps to the, you know, two different um, light rays have come in, two different photons have activated those um, cones, now they're sending independent bleeps to the brain. Where's the mixing going on? And in the brain, there's no color. But your mind 
interprets when it sees that these two are somehow meant to be close together, your mind constructs the color. So color exists entirely in the mind. You have no idea how it exists in the outside world. You have an experience of it, but you have no actual knowledge of the actuality of the outside world. And a simple example that we do with many audiences, which really gets them, is to suggest that you cover your eyes with your hands so that no light gets in, and you just press a little bit on your eyeballs, just gently but firmly, and you start to see colors. So you're experiencing color when there's no light involved. So color cannot be considered to be a property of light. It's a property of qualia of the mind. QED. That's and that's true for all the other sensory perceptions. Color, um, it forms, uh, sounds, same thing. Tastes and smells, it, they're all generated within the mind. Because each one of them, whether it's um, somebody put some food in your mouth, that sets up some receptors which send bleep, bleep, bleep to the, to the brain. There's no difference between that bleep <laughs> coming from the neurons connected to your tongue to that coming from the neurons connected to your eyes. It's just a different bleep in a different part of the brain. But your mind is associating with the bleeps here as, and it gives you the sense of a taste of something, a flavor of something. Whereas over here, it's generating a picture. And over there, it's generating it as a sound. But you see, we take all of this for granted because we've been experiencing it since we were born. And we are completely fooled as to what is happening. And we don't understand that I am not actually interacting with the outside world. Data from the outside world is coming in through my senses, going into my brain, but my mind is then constructing the picture and impressions and experience of the world that I think are the tastes, colors, um, sounds of the world. This is how we're confused. We need to have a completely new appreciation of the wonder that is happening. And when we appreciate that wonder, we understand then the nature of what the mind is doing for us and how consciousness is simply the receptor and observer of all of that wonder. Mm. Beautiful. So there's a lot more we could discuss, but uh, maybe, you know, I, I'll, you could, would you like to speak something about, uh, your Atma Paradigm seminars so that our readers can know, viewers can know about it. And then maybe we okay. could continue some discussion in a future session about some specific topics okay. because I have a lot of questions about what you have mentioned till now and I could flesh, well, out, flesh out some things. But uh, I, I would, it would certainly be great to continue our discussion because you're well tuned into the, the various topics and understand all the issues. Um, and that's uh, very special and appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and yes, thank you for um, giving me an opportunity also to talk about the Atma Paradigm as a series. It's something I've been working on for about 15 years. Um, and it was my attempt just to try and provide a framework, a philosophical framework that reaches from consciousness all the way through analysis of what we mean by matter and reality, what we mean by life and all the aspects of how biology works. And once you understand the role of consciousness as primary, and this aspect you mentioned of intentionality, causation, will, actually, we understand then how the Bhagavatam is teaching us how consciousness, how the desires of consciousness feed through into the reality that we experience, how they generate the forms of this world, how they generate the species that we will then take as our body, to enjoy with in different ways. Everything actually comes from consciousness originally. It is driving. And then once we explore life, then you can start to talk about the universe. We 
take things in a different order. You see, the okay. physicalists start, well, Big Bang. And that's a question, of course, in itself. Okay, Big Bang creates matter. Matter coalesces to form the structure of the universe, galaxies, planetary systems, and so on. And then in one of those little rocks, you know, somehow or other, some chemicals get together and produce life. And then in somehow or other, some of those life forms, one particular, the humans, develop a big enough brain to produce consciousness. So that is their order. Matter, universe, life, consciousness. Oh, so stupid. And we... The actual order is consciousness. Then we can look at what matter is. Then we can understand the, because of the combination of consciousness and matter, what life is. And once you understand what life is and what its purpose is and what it's trying to do, you can understand why there is a universe, why it takes the forms that it does, why it provides the environments for the life to flourish and enjoy in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that's the order in which we explore. So the Atma paradigm is meant to look at everything from consciousness, matter, and life through the universe and beyond. And um, it's a set of total of 32 talks. We have just completed the first eight on consciousness. And a lot of that, if you've understood this conversation, you know, as a viewer, then you will have got much of the um, material that we have presented in that. Um, and those videos are all available um, on our YouTube channel. Just go on and type in Atma Paradigm. We're about to start next week um, on matter and reality. So we're going to have a little bit of a recap, um, show where we've got so far, and then explore the nature of matter from the Sankhya perspective, both in terms of how we experience the world, but also probably, which is more exciting, I think, how we interact and help to manifest the world. And then that gives us an understanding of how matter is manipulated because of the desires of the Atma. Now, this doesn't leave Krishna out of the picture because we know that famous verse, Nityo Nityananam Chaitanas Chaitananam, that Eko Bahunam Yovadadati Kaman, that out of all the eternal conscious beings, there is one conscious being who maintains and fulfills the desires of all the others. And that's exactly the description of the material world. How the consciousnesses of the aggregate consciousness of all the atmas is taken and facilitated in how the material world manifests, develops, and ultimately is wound up. So basically the Atma paradigm is offering that as a philosophical framework. And the idea is that it's, it's not a complete picture. I'm not saying this is everything and this is, you, you know, what I'm saying is this gives a framework. Now I'm working with many, many PhD devotees and our students around the world, and they're giving their input in different ways. Some of them are involved in physics, some of them are involved in biology, some in astrophysicists, um, and they are helping, to, they are working with the overall picture of the, what we call the Atma paradigm together. And we're building this into a complete um, incorporation of all science from a consciousness-based perspective. That's the whole point. We want, we're not trying to get rid of science. We love science. But we know its limitations. And we know that it can only progress and advance when it is driven by the understanding that consciousness comes first. That we need a consciousness-based science which explores a consciousness-based universe. Yes, you know, this is thrilling in a sense. We are, we are not just adding something to the scientific worldview, but we are actually reconceptualizing the whole world from a consciousness-centered paradigm. So, exactly. And so that's that a philosophical, like, it's simply a, a philosophical change. We're not saying give up your science. We're just saying you need a different philosophy to understand your science. Yes. That, so your problem you, is... Yeah? yeah, how did you come up with the particular combination of the word Atma paradigm? 
that's quite an attractive <laughs> title. Mm. The paradigm is, um, you know, people often talk about the physicalist paradigm. I, that is a perspective by which you view everything. Mm. And the difficulty is that modern science only applies physicalism as its yes. sole philosophical way of interpreting what it's doing. And that's just, I mean, it, again, it's just silly. It is just pathetic. Science shouldn't be under the sway of any particular philosophy. Science is meant to be free. Mm. But if you are going to use, if you are going, but you will have to apply philosophy to science in order to understand it, you might as well do it in one that actually makes sense of the science, which is consistent with the science, which doesn't have as many holes and quandaries and problems as the physicalist picture of science does, but actually explains everything and which is in keeping with what we know about ourselves. That's the point about the Atma paradigm. It is a different way of viewing science, which actually resonates with what we know about ourselves. I am alive. I exist. You know, <laughs> I experience stuff. That's all real. And which is also consistent and supportive of what we would say is the theological proposition. <clears throat> we haven't discussed in the Atma paradigm, and the scientific method can never reach God. Even philosophy cannot really help to um, reveal God. Krishna can only reveal himself. You know, mm -hmm. the processes of bhakti yoga, that is its own science. And the Atma paradigm is trying to show you that you can have a philosophical, a rational, intellectual view of the science that we have built up. And that is entirely consistent <coughs> with the processes of bhakti, which will then open up the bits that are still left to discover, the important bits, Krishna and the spiritual world. Okay. So doesn't the word Atma itself come out as a little <coughs> religious or spiritual? Uh, because somehow, the, still what I found is, the Atma paradigm sounds quite cool, if you could say. If it's just Atma, it might have sounded a little too religious, but it's a very creative combination. Yeah, I mean, um, most um, folk, I mean, in India, obviously, people know the word Atma, at least they've heard it. But in the West, it tends to be in the academic <coughs> papers as Atman. It tends to be how they phrase it, Atman. And there's no difference in real terms. It's just a kind of um, etymological kind of thing. But I like to use the word Atma because I won't use the word soul. Because yeah, in the yeah. West, people are confused what they mean by soul. Just as they're confused about mind, spirit, God. These are actually hopeless terms, I'm afraid. Hopeless terms, yeah, that's true. You know, I'm not trying to kind of put down the concepts and what they represent. But the problem is those words in English have just been used mm. and abused <clears throat> in so many different ways that they're practically useless for trying to say anything specific and precise. Yes. So we say, instead of talking about the soul as being the source of consciousness, because as soon as you wear the soul, they've got a wrong conception. People think, I am this body, I have a soul, it's that part of me which doesn't die or something. Yeah. I it's know. confused. It's, it's really, you know, or it's the music I like. But um, music I like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you okay. know, um, or it's just some kind of, you know, feeling I have, you know, passion I have about the world. No, but what we're trying to say is that we need to define this source of consciousness. That when we're talking about consciousness, we're not talking about what we are conscious of, we're not talking about consciousness as the subject matter that we are conscious of, nor is it the state of mind, but it is that ability to have experiences yes. about what's in our mind and what state we're in. So it's the ability to have experiences, or more accurately, the phenomenon of being able to have that ability. And really, we want to get it further because we want to tie it down a little ontologically. It is that entity which is composed of and possesses that 
ability, a phenomenon of consciousness. So consciousness is not something we have. Consciousness is something we are. That's beautiful. So then, rather than and using... And we're defining Atma as that which we are. The individual yeah. unit of consciousness. Mm. Which, of course, ties in with Vedanta. Atma as that kind of quantum of Brahman. And particularly a quantum of Krishna's energy. Yes, yeah, beautiful. And then in so, that sense, using the word Atma is much more, uh, you could say, philosophically pregnant than using the word consciousness alone. Because Exactly. It, it ties down where we're assigning consciousness to. Yes. Because, again, consciousness is a very big word. It's been, you know, conflated with so many different things. Um, but we are tying it down. No, here's it. But it belongs with this entity, the Atma. All right. Now we can understand how that entity interacts with all these other aspects that are to do with conscious experience or state of mind or whatever. Yes. So I'll also put a link to your Atma Paradigm channel in the description of this video. So and, uh, I'll, I'll also send you a little um, uh, flyer we have now for the next series. And the idea is that people can join in next week. And even if they haven't listened to any of the previous ones, they'll be able to follow along. That's the idea. Okay. Yes. True. So I'll just quickly summarize maybe what we discussed, the conclusion. So we started by talking about your journey and how you lost 15 years almost. You're focused on the study of science which you already had a background from and uh, you felt that uh, you made this point that getting into the dis debate on creation and evolution it's just a distraction which is unproductive and focusing on consciousness is something which we can distinctively do and there are a lot of well, i have studied that but i learned a lot myself here about uh, in this discussion about especially you know we, we started by explaining the hard problem of consciousness in different ways the the conflation between the senses the mind and the soul is what has stymied western philosophical efforts to address that issue and to if we can differentiate between the two and that's what our tradition does that's very significant and how do we ex introduce consciousness into science with its with its uh, whatever worldview it has, it says that just as science can't actually explain what matter is, it explains what matter is like and what it does. Similarly, we could approach that same way to consciousness, what consciousness is like and what consciousness does. And then we can invert the whole thing because consciousness is what we first experience. You quoted how to say that there's no consciousness is the silliest idea that can be there. So, and then rather than, and we, start with consciousness as foundation and then we build a bottom-up approach that there are all these problems in science especially like say qualia which can't be explained our lived experience can't be explained and then we offer the vedantic paradigm it's not just vedanta you say vedanta sankhya and yoga all of them you bring them together to offer solutions to existing problems and then in the atma paradigm lectures the science begins with the universe Whereas we begin with consciousness, from consciousness we come to the, what is the mi mind, consciousness? Well, to, we look at matter and reality. Consciousness and to matter, and matter mind. to life, and life to universe. And this is, a, this is really a radically new, at the same time radically, uh, powerfully intuitive way of studying reality. So... And I look forward to having a further discussion soon in the near future with you. Thank you very much for joining today. No, thank you very much for, for your uh, interview. Really enjoyed it and best wishes in your own work and uh, outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, Krishna.